the awful snow streets to, uh, uh, to our panel discussion um, uh, on the Watson intelligence. This is the second um, panel discussion that we've done this season at the new series that we're starting. Um, it really is an attempt to uh, open up the ideas of the play by talking to people that are not just the ones who made the play, but also people that are out in the community who, um, who might have interesting things to say about some of the ideas that the play raises. Uh, all the panelists that uh, in this series are chosen by the, by the writer of each play that we do in the season. Um, and uh, I am happy to uh, introduce these panelists to you right now. Um, so uh, at the end of the table, we have uh, Maria Konnikova. Um, uh, Maria Konnikova is the author of Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, which was a New York Times bestseller. It's been translated into 16 languages. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications, including the New, York, the New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and Slate. Um, to her right is Robert Krolwich. Robert Krolwich is a science correspondent for NPR. His blog, Krolwich Wonders, features drawings, cartoons, and videos that illustrate hard to see concepts in science. And of course, he's the co host of Radio Lab, a nationally distributed radio podcast series that explores new developments in science. Um, to Robert's right is Eric Brown. Eric is the director and principal investigator for Watson Technologies at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. He's currently leading the team to apply Watson to clinical decision support in healthcare. And uh, to his right is Madeline George, the author of many plays, including but not limited to The Zero Hour, Precious Little, Seven Homeless Mammoths, mm. Wander in New England, and The Curious Case of the Watson Intelligence. And uh, to Madeline's right is me, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, I'm Adam Greenfield, I'm the director of New Play Development here at Playwrights Horizons. Um, we'll, uh, we'll start by having uh, Madeline throw some questions at these panelists, and then in the last few minutes um, of this discussion, uh, we will uh, open, the question, open this up to questions from you guys. Um, so thanks again for, for being here, and, uh, and I'll throw it over to you, Madeline. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, uh, so I'm Madeline, and I um, I am gonna I'm gonna ask a couple of sort of discrete questions to the people uh, the people here on the panel with me, um, and I want to thank you guys so much for being here and participating in this, and also everybody here for staying in the snow. Um, uh, there's a lot of different ways to sort of come into this play um, for me, and also I think um, for people who are. Uh, but I want to start with Eric Brown from uh, from IBM because there's a you know there's a computer at the center of this play that I've written. But really, um, my version of IBM's Watson is kind of an um, egregious bastardization of the real piece of dazzling technology. And I wanted to ask um, Eric to talk to you a little bit about what the real IBM Watson is and how it functions. Okay. Well, uh, if you think about Watson and where it came from, it actually goes back to. I think the very first digital computer, and since that time, scientists have been trying to figure out how to get computers to interact naturally with humans and to understand language, to even think and reason and behave intelligently. And uh, this goes back to the 1950s, the 1960s, and there's been, I think, a lot of progress along the way, but it turns out that getting computers to do all of that is really hard. <laughs> So when we got to uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, we had been combining a lot of these different technologies in areas that we call natural language processing, machine learning, information retrieval, uh, knowledge representation and reasoning, all these different areas combined into building a system that can do automatic question answering. But even in the early 2000s, the uh, performance of that technology was not nearly good enough to use it in any real meaningful way. So we wanted to have a way to really push the boundaries on that and, and get over some, some humps and some hurdles to really drive it up. And one way we do that is with a big grand challenge project. And that can really motivate the team and create some excitement around it. And this idea of building a system that could compete on Jeopardy came up out of that. And this turned out to be a great way to drive that question answering technology and create something that uh, now actually is at the level of performance where we can apply it to solve real problems. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's possible for you to say this in like a nutshell, but is the way that Watson answers questions. Did you guys see the Jeopardy tournament by any chance? Did you see Watson wipe the floor with these human beings? <laughs> um, does Watson's uh, cognition or thought process or, men or is, does Watson think like a person? So uh, 
first of all, when you, if you saw the Jeopardy match, and you would, they would occasionally pan the audience, and the core technical team that built Watson, there's about 25 of us, sat in this lower uh, left corner, my left, your right, and everybody in the audience was having a great time, except when you saw the technical team, because <laughs> we were very nervous, and there was no guarantee that it was going to work. Uh, but it was, it was very exciting, and when you um, think about if you, so how does Watson think, and does it, does it think the same way that a human does? Uh, it, what we wanted to do was build a system that could behave like a human, but internally it doesn't necessarily work the same way. Uh, it has a lot of functions that sound like the way humans work. So we have something that can do parsing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you uh, uh, remember back to eighth grade and your English class and you had to diagram sentences, and so uh, you know, all of us aspiring engineers and computer scientists thought that would be the most boring thing. You know, what's the subject? What's the verb? What's the object? What's, what are the prepositions? What are parts of speech? Turns out you have to know that if you want to build a computer system that can do that. So there's a lot of of formalism in the way we get the computer to understand natural language, but ultimately, internally, it doesn't really work the same way as a human does. Because it's working simultaneously on many problems in the... It, well, the, the brain is extremely complex. There's something like three billion neurons in it, and that's, um, in terms of hardware, much different than the way the, the current computer systems work, what we call these von Neumann architectures with a processor, main memory, disk drives, and uh, sequence of instructions that, that operate on the data. I mean, the human brain is this massively parallel uh, set of neurons that's, that's transmitting things. And while we have done work, and we actually have an interesting project going on now to try and simulate that, it's a much different processing model. And actually, we have this notion of what we call cognitive computing and in fact believe that this is going to be a very important computing paradigm for a lot of applications going forward. Some of that is the software and the way the computers operate and learn. Mm -hmm. Actually some of it will be on the hardware side where simulating the way the brain works will become more and more important. That's interesting. I want to um, sort of shift over and ask Maria a question about also about thinking. Um, Maria's book Mastermind uh, is a, a book about Sherlock Holmes and mindfulness. To, synopsize it very briefly. Um, and I wondered if you would talk a little bit about your idea about the way that Holmes's mind works in those stories, and also to talk about your idea about System Watson and System Holmes, if you don't mind. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, my idea behind the way that Holmes thinks does have to do with, as you say, mindfulness. So it's the difference, as he puts it, between just seeing and both seeing and observing the world. So are you really present? Are you in the moment? Do you really take the time to take in everything around you. And that really, to me, in, the, in a modern reality where you have your cell phone, where you have constant connectivity, that's something that we need to strive for. And it, it's becoming incre increasingly difficult um, because mindfulness is kind of the opposite of multitasking uh, in the sense that our brain can't really concentrate on anything if we're trying to allow multiple input streams of information in at the same time. And so if you want to think more along Holmesian lines, you have to learn how to let that go and how to let your mind just do one thing at a time. And what you find out is you actually become much more productive that way. Um, when you're not trying to get as much done, you start getting things done much more quickly. Um, I learned this about myself as I was writing the book when I thought that I, of all people, was incredibly mindful and very and very good at doing this. Then I realized that I needed software to turn off the internet when I was writing. So I have a program on my computer called Freedom that blocks the internet <laughs> entirely. It prevents me from going online. And I first, you have a 10-day trial period that's free. And then it costs, I think, $10. And I downloaded the free trial because my thinking was, I don't actually need this, but hey, it would be fun to try, just as an exercise for writing the book. And what I found was my fingers would just automatically, when I would get to the end of a sentence and I, had, and I wasn't quite sure what the next sentence was going to be, my, my fingers would go to the Apple tab to, to switch to my email just to see if anyone was interested in getting a question answered in that moment. <laughs> in that moment. And, when I realized how often I wanted to do that, 
and how often freedom blocked me from doing that. I paid the $10, and it's the best $10 <laughs> I've ever spent. And all of a sudden, my mind had time to work because it had never been, I'd forgotten how to be quiet, you know, how to be bored, how to just let myself <coughs> think, how to let my mind wander and really focus on something. Um, I'd always want to reach for something to fill up that space. That's what Holmes teaches you to do. And Watson is kind of the opposite. Watson finds it impossible to, to sit still. So where Holmes really does focus on one thing at a time, Watson does encapsulate, and I love Watson, by the way, so let me, let me just take a step back and say that I think Watson is incredibly intelligent and that system Watson is quite essential um, in the way that we think. But it's the system that kind of jumps to conclusions right away that's much more reflexive as opposed to system of Holmes. It's much hotter as opposed to Holmes's cooler system. Um, so it's just a, an immediate reaction to the world. And if you think back to the stories, um, to those of you who've reread them recently, you'll notice that Holmes sits quiet and silently a lot, not doing anything. And Watson can't do that. He really wants to interrupt him. He wants to read, but he can't. So he puts the book down. He always gets up. He gets a glass of brandy. He does this. He does that. Ultimately, he goes to his club because he just can't deal with the silence. And that's, <laughs> that, that's kind of how, that's how our minds work most of the time if we don't learn to just take a deep breath and allow that silence to come in. That sounds very, <clears throat> it sounds like it does increase productivity, but how do you feel about like, you know, friendship and attachment in, re in relationship to this? Like, Holmes has a little bit of trouble. I mean, he gets his <laughs> silence and he gets his reflection, but yes. he doesn't get his love so much. That's true, that's true. And I think Watson, one of the things Watson does is humanize Holmes. He really brings that side out of him. And by the end of the canon, by the end of the stories, Holmes can't work without Watson. He needs him. He, as Watson says, I'd become one of his habits mm -hmm. as, as the pipe, as the violin. So I think Holmes does appreciate it, and he loves Watson deeply. And there are the moments, mo the, some of the best moments in the books are the moments where Holmes thinks something's happened to Watson, and right away, you know, his reaction, it's his closest friend. Right. And so I don't think that Holmes necessarily doesn't understand friendship. He just really separates emotion from the cerebral aspects of life. He doesn't let the two cross over um, unless in those extreme moments you, you see those sparks that are there. He just has them much more in control than most of us do. Uh -huh. That's great. Maybe dovetailing with this a little bit, um, Robert, I wanted to ask you about the process of <coughs> taking complex scientific or technological or in other ways technical subject matter and translating it into storytelling that is accessible to a lay public. What's involved in that for you? And do you ever feel any kind of tension between fidelity to the facts and shaping them in some way? I mean, I speak as a person who has dealt, uh, done away with all fidelity to facts in order to... <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think I just, uh, it's sort of uh, private, I, I think. I wonder about something, and then I get into a conversation with myself, and I, uh, or, or with my partner Jad, we we'll probably do the same thing together, and we go and recruit people or books or information, and really, over and over again, it's what, 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 <laughs> what, <laughs> until you end up with oh, that's that's. <laughs> So it doesn't really, um, it's not a complicated thing, except emotionally, it, it's, um, it's trying to find a place where you can settle half convinced, and usually never more than half convinced, that you've arrived at a plausible version of the answer to the question you ask. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And you see a virtue in leaving a trace of the process of the figuring out. Well, that's our... That's our job. So I, th I think in journalism, there's a, a tendency to get an assignment and then to go off and learn about the question you've been asked and to research it and then to bring home facts and then to have the facts checked and then double checked and edited into place. And you become increasingly sure of your position as you do this. 
until by the time you get on television or on the radio, you are, and you're talking as if you know everything you're about to say because it's all been carefully vetted. But, um, but all that stuff that happened before, all that sort of knocking your head against the wall and wondering and arguing about what is true, and that is all kept out of you. So in this show that we do, we just put the first part on the air. So you get to hear what a curious person goes through in order to find some, the answer to the question. So that's all in view as opposed to out of view. And so, yeah, that's, um, and we hope that that somehow reminds people about all the humiliations and the pleasures of asking questions. Do you, I mean, I'm a little curious also from uh, both from Maria's perspective, but also Eric's like, what do you see a virtue in laying out the thought process behind something? Is that helpful in terms of translating complicated pro, uh, con concepts? Your, your motivations are different in doing so, I would assume. Yeah, well, I, absolutely. I think one of the reasons why I thought Sherlock Holmes was a good way to mind and the brain is that Holmes asks questions and because there's Watson, because it's the two of them, you see the entire process thought out. And one of the things that Watson forces Holmes to do is to figure out how he got somewhere. Because he doesn't, his brain makes that leap instantaneously. You know, he's, as Robert was saying, he's like the person who's already done all that work. And so he's already on TV and saying, this is exactly what's happened. And then there's Watson who's saying, what, Holmes, how in the world did you get there? And it forces Holmes to take a step back and just think, oh, wait, how did, how did I get there? And then he starts going back and unwinding the process and figuring out what made him come to his conclusion. When he does that, not only does he become, I think, a better thinker and a better detective, but he also thinks, sees flaws in his own reasoning that he missed the first time around. Mm -hmm. And Watson, in that sense, corrects him. Um, because even though Watson might not be sure where Holmes went wrong, when Holmes actually has to say that out loud and go through verbally all the steps of the process, suddenly you see holes that weren't there. You see conclusions that were jumped to in a non-logical way. And in that sense, he's the perfect storyteller. He's the perfect person to use to explain science. And I've tried to use that in my writing. Um, it, it forces you to question your and to go back and to say, well, why, why is this true all the time? Um, and one of my favorite things about Holmes is that he is curious. He's always curious. He's always asking questions about everything. He's not just monolithically focused on being a detective. He loves art. He loves opera. He loves, he has this childlike curiosity and love of learning. Um, my favorite line is the game's afoot. It's a game. Hmm. It's very brave of Watson to, uh, to push this very smart guy through those. Like, I, I'm married to a woman who's from a family that's just a, unusually smart in a very logical way. And sometimes at the dinner table of my in-laws, they would say to me, Robert, do you mind we're going to have an abstract discussion? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, well, I can, I can do that. Say, and they all, with their eyes and their body language, quite agreed that I couldn't. <laughs> and then, then they would launch into it. Then they just suddenly, and to me, it was going from, I'll have some potatoes, please. Oh, what a funny movie that was, to I had no idea what they were saying. And I, uh, it, was very, it was interesting to me. It, it, it took a certain amount of guts to just even be part of that family. <laughs> because you, you could so easily be left behind. But the, the thing, I think that gives you the, po the power to stay at the table is this notion that if you were to introduce the whoms mm -hmm. into that, then you would, you would actually teach them something as yeah. well as um, come out of your own cloud of mystery. But. This, this notion of being able to explain something actually is very important. And that's one of the, the current challenges that we're facing or trying to drive with the next generation of the Watson technology. And so when you saw it on Jeopardy, you just saw it responding with an answer to a question and it was judged right or wrong and the game moved on. And when humans are playing, they could guess at the correct answer, get it right, and that would be perfectly fine and the game moves on. But when we're applying the technology to medicine, you don't necessarily want to be guessing at the correct answer. <laughs> and 
in particular, we imagine this technology, again, being a, an assistant, so that the human is free to focus on the really hard problems, but the assistant is kind of covering all the bases. It's, it's considering all the possibilities. It's leveraging all of the information that's out there, whether it's the patient's lengthy electronic health record, all of the latest research that's in millions of documents, and then making recommendations. But you can't just make a recommendation and, and when you ask why, you say, because I said so. You have to give a reasonable explanation and one that the expert can understand. And so that's a, a, a really interesting way where we're continuing to move forward with this. Is there a team explanation, like as part of the, is there a sub team working on that, just that component? It's, um, <coughs> at the moment, it's really about the whole approach to how we do it. Being able to explain every inference or every step by referencing uh, some passage or document from the underlying corpus. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we're explaining it by giving you the, the actual evidence. The next stage would be, to actually generate that explanation in some meaningful way, and that would be the explanation team's job. Explanation team, that's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> I wonder, um, I'm not sure about time, but I want to ask every one of you a, qu a question about the, the, um, the nature of help. Um, this is a play that sort of is interested not only in the sidekick figure and what it's like to be the sidekick or the second, but also in um, what, uh, what is meaningful about offering help to other people. And I wonder in terms of journalism, in terms of computing and technology, like, do you see yourself as helping others? Yeah, I, I, I was sort of intrigued by that the play uh, goes to maybe the most fundamental need, which is that people have to be unlonely and to be spoken to and loved, and that that was very confusing for the heroine of the play, who, um, who felt it happening and felt herself being invaded and understood and, uh, and felt strangely crowded by that and frightened and that she had to, it also seemed to have, it seemed to have little bits of, uh, of her husband's um, mo motivations and her husband's needs sort of somehow attached to it. But, but in, I was thinking, I was thinking to, to her, and this is not an answer to your question. That's fine. <laughs> I was saying, oh, come on, just go ahead and, and uh, take what you've been given here. Like, what are you so frightened of? And uh, um, I thought there were like two things going on. There was, there was this like, like um, accepting, accepting a program if, because this play didn't seem to, I couldn't tell whether these were just people who were good lovers or whether these were just really clever machines. That question was sometimes <laughs> left sort of up in the air. But, and then this other thought of being sort of, you know, an alpha beta, like being the best, second best person that you could possibly be. <laughs> was also a very interesting notion. So I, I found myself sitting there in the play thinking, um, this is a view of artificial intelligence which is very nervous, which I think we all are about artificial intelligence. And, uh, and that if we could one day design something that could really masquerade as another loving entity, that we would not know what to do with the feeling of being loved by a thing since we're having already so much trouble being loved by a person. <laughs> and I thought that was very interesting. That's, I, a, yeah. uh, that's an intriguing take on it to me, too. Yeah. You were going to say something? Well, this notion of an assistant, I find the Merrick from the Sherlock Holmes era very interesting in that his objective was to replace his wife and create his own perfect assistant. And, uh, I think that's completely misguided, and so I think it's interesting you bring that out. Um, and you know, so I'm so glad you think that's misguided. We have, we have uh, and, you know, today. So we all have our our portable devices, our smartphones, and you know, my wife and I are some of the meanest parents in town because we actually haven't let any of our children have their own smartphones yet. But we're so concerned that these devices become substitutes for human connection and when you see teenagers today they don't even realize that the phone can actually make a phone call it, it only can make text messages <laughs> and um, 
But uh, so this notion of you know what is the role of the assistant, I think it, it can go too far if you think it completely replaces that yeah. human connection. And uh, I think the focus is much more on the strengths of what the assistant can do. And you know, in the case of the IBM Watson, it's analyzing huge volumes of data to make it available to you so that as the human, you can then use the judgment and the decision. But I thought all of the different elements of the play kind of emphasize you know, the role and the strengths of the assistant complementing mm -hmm. the lead there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that um, the notion of the, the alpha beta, is that, is that how you phrased it? <laughs> That's a great way of phrasing it. Um, is an incredibly important one. Um, to go back to the original Holmes and Watson, there is a moment where Holmes says to Watson that you are not yourself luminous, but you're a kind of a vessel of light, meaning for my light to shine through you. And he means that as the highest compliment. Sure he does. <laughs> <laughs> and Watson, God bless him, takes it well. And, and doesn't say, did you, what did you say? I'm not luminous myself. <laughs> and, and instead, you know, <laughs> he understands that Holmes is really trying to say something nice, which is there are people who make it possible for the Sherlock Holmeses to really to shine. And Holmes wouldn't shine without Watson. Um, he'd, he'd be much duller, you know, he'd kind of be all dusty and can't really see well. And, um, and Watson really makes sure to keep him polished. And one of the things that I think that serves in the real world isn't just to, I think, it goes back to the role of explanation as well. You know, it's something that makes you constantly ask why and answer why. But it also keeps you from being overconfident which is one of the things that the Holmeses of the world, the alpha, alphas, have to watch out for. Um, it's easy to think, I'm the best, I know what I'm doing better than anyone else, and so I'm, not, I'm going to stop taking feedback, I'm going to stop taking criticism. And a lot of people do that. And then you drop off. Not only do you stop learning, but at some point you start getting worse because your brain is just kind of stagnant. Um, and it takes real courage for Watson to, st to stand up to Holmes, but it takes real understanding for Holmes to be open to that and to tell Watson, hey, Watson, you know, if ever, if ever I screw up like this again, because he does screw up, tell me. I want mm. to hear it from you. And so he might get mad initially, but then he takes the feedback. And I think that's the, another, another way in which assistance is always required by anyone. There's not a single person who doesn't need a Watson. But this is very interesting to me because I feel like my concern or uh, suspicion or skepticism about our increasing dependence on devices has to do with exactly this. Like to have a, an assistant or a partner or someone else who is offering you critical feedback on some level, who's pushing against you, it is, it, that dynamic is a very human dynamic and a humanizing dynamic. And I worry sometimes that our little magical machines and the, and the, the greater minds, the, the greater uh, mechanistic <laughs> minds that we're going to become increasingly involved with, they won't do that for us. They act more like mirrors, the flattering mirrors, you yeah. know, and that they, and that we don't, we don't get from them that kind of check um, that we get from the people that we love and greatly appreciate all the negative feedback that they give us all the time. <laughs> So that would be an interesting, that's a, t that's a very rough technology too. Like I was thinking of Henry Higgins and Elias Doolittle. So at the end of that play, he, in the Shaw play, or in My Fair Lady, he, he, she stood up to him. She's left him and left him high and dry. And then he realizes how much he needs her. And it's, he throws a shoe at her in My Fair Lady at the very end, maybe at the end of Pygmalion too. Um, but she's tougher than the shoe. And we all know that. And, um, <laughs> I think, from a technological point of view, it would, it would be close to impossible to create a machine that has something like pride, um, which is really what we're talking about. And uh, so I think you can build an algorithm for, you know, let me help you in any way that I possibly can, which is the phrase you, that these machine folks keep uttering. But you know that the difference between a machine and a person is that will be let me help you in any way that I, I, I can with my pride intact. And that's a very different algorithm. <laughs> do, we, um, do we want to open it? Yeah. Um, that's, yeah sure. um, so we'd like to uh, open up uh, 
Hi. <laughs> uh, technology. Uh, I'll open this up to some questions from you guys, but because I'm holding the microphone, I'm going to uh, actually go ahead and go first. I actually had a question that I wanted to ask Eric. <laughs> I just, I'm about to give the microphone away, and I just didn't want to do it without asking the question. I mean, you've you, you created Watson, and like, what, what is the experience like watching him become a character in a play that is, you know, what, what is it like watching a characterization of Watson for you? What's the experience like sitting in the audience watching that? It's, I think it's, it's a natural progression from uh, college, graduate school, computer scientist, being on Jeopardy, Watson character in a play. <laughs> it's quite natural. Uh, I have to say, when we first heard about a play about Watson uh, being written, and this must have been back in the spring, uh, everybody on the technical team thought, this is very strange. I can't imagine you could possibly write a play around this in, in any way. But when we uh, met Madeline and Lee uh, up in, uh, at the Yorktown Heights Research Center, and had a chance to learn more about the play, actually it was quite fascinating. And the portrayal of Watson as a computer system, uh, obviously it's not exactly like the way Watson really works, but the vision and the sort of the, the imagination and, and what, it we'd, what we'd like it to be was very consistent, I thought, with uh, where we'd like the technology to go. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so uh, now as a part of I will see the microphone, um, and uh, I'll give this to the part where we torture uh, Alex Strum, the associate literary manager of Clarence Rising, but he went around and handed it to whoever has their hand up. Um, so uh, here, Alex. Um, so do you have any, any questions for the any member of the panelists? Hi. Um, the Watson machine. I, I, I understand that there's a lot of aspects of AI involved in uh, its use of language and uh, responding to the normal language. And I, and I understand there's a lot of very new AI involved in that. But how is the it's it's working on Jeopardy any more than just a, a an extremely large encyclopedia in terms of its competing with humans and, and encyclopedia knowledge of certain people? How is it? Different? Right. Well, certainly you need to have encyclopedic knowledge to be a good Jeopardy competitor because of the, the broad nature of all the questions. The, there's, there's a couple of things that made Jeopardy a, a really nice way to drive the problem and to push on a couple of things we wanted to do, uh, specifically around the natural language understanding. So the questions, of course, are delivered in natural language. And while they're written, I'll call them a clue. The clues are written to have a single correct or unambiguously correct answer. The clues themselves can be quite ambiguous or complex and difficult to understand. So just tackling that part of understanding the question was an interesting challenge. The other piece, though, was the whole approach to building the, the knowledge base that the system is going to use to answer questions was very much based on this principle of leveraging knowledge the way humans naturally communicate it and record it, which would be text. As opposed to trying to curate data and make, make it structured and put it into a form that the computer could reason over in a very straightforward way. That would require a lot of humans to spend a lot of time uh, curating everything in the world and putting it into a structured form. So instead, we use text information. And again, you have this problem of understanding text. And uh, you know, humans are very creative in the way they use language. They can uh, express the same thing many different ways, or they can use the same word to mean different things depending on the context. So all of these different nuances of, and ambiguities of language are really interesting challenges. European question again, and I'd like to put one to you. Sure. I'm, I'm a little hesitant about this, having sat through two and a half hours watching the play. So, what I want to ask you is Great. Well, in the sense of how did you come to this? Where did you want to go with it? Talk to me about what brought you to machine human interaction and how you came to write this play, if anything, where you think you might be going. 
So the question is, how did, how did the play come about? Mechanical versus human. And then this question of, right. I mean, I had had a germ of an idea um, a, a while back about looking at the helper or the sidekick figure, you know, looking at the, the stories that sidekicks or helpers are embedded in from their perspective. Um, and then I had noticed that a couple of them were named Watson, and I thought that was kind of suggestive and an interesting starting point. Um, but I didn't really know what to do with it. But then when the Jeopardy tournament happened in 2011, I felt like it was sort of catalyzed, because then I thought, well, this is a very interesting helper. Um, and it broadens the question of help um, and makes it, uh, allows me to look at not just what's it like for the helper in a story, but what's it like for us now that we're receiving a particular kind of help on a regular basis, this technological help. Um, and uh, as I was sort of working on this idea of this fractured Watson or this compound Watson, I started to realize that I was interested in the question of dependency as well. Like, how is the help that we're getting from our devices um, uh, in triggering our fears of dependency? And how are our fears of dependency manifest also in our relationship to the political system and in our relationship to each other? So that was the sort of suite of questions that I was looking at as I was doing the work, while also trying to figure out how to make a single love story move through time, you know, as it jumped from, these one, from one of these kinds of stories to another. Um, I don't really know what, I don't really know if, if, if there's a sort of part two of this kind of story for me. I feel a little bit like this is the, it, it has its own sort of contained quality. I watch the, I watch people dealing with sorry and uh, I, you can see, a, I don't, that's this. Uh, you mean on the phone? Yeah. yeah. This is this lady who lives in the iPhone. Siri. <laughs> Siri, I mean. Siri. Yeah, Siri. And so, so, so people like, sort of like get dazzled by Siri because she's so conversational. And then they become irritated at Siri. And then they become, it seems like gradually, they kind of come to terms with Siri. Mm -hmm. And they start treating her as if she's like a machine again. And they comment in front of her mm -hmm. about her. <laughs> About her inadequacies. Her inadequacies. <laughs> and you can actually watch sort of warmth go to anger, go to, go to just come sort of a little middle, because she hasn't really passed the test. She's Although not great. That's part of it, don't you think? She, people yeah. feel frustrated by her. She doesn't do yeah. what she promises she, she might do. Curse. She, she doesn't know how to curse. Yeah, no. But she's, at the beginning, she's plausibly, plausibly conversational. Well, her opening salvo, what, what can I help you with, is so open-ended. And then when, you're, when, <laughs> then when you come back with, uh, with a task, she, she's like, wouldn't you like me help, to help you find Brian? Who's <laughs> 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 Brian? Although, although you know, at, the, at first blush, when you say, I really want a pizza, and she goes, there are 12 pizzas within 13 feet of you. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's sort of astounding. And you think, oh, Siri, whoa. <laughs> And she so, pays back a little bit. Like she needs, if she she can get to know you a little bit better yeah, through, through interaction. But there's, yeah. but Watson seems poised to do to do better. Perhaps you're not you're not at liberty to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, when the Jeopardy tournament was happening, when I first found out about um, the Watson. Watched it, and the, this is actually something I said in conversation with Madeline several weeks ago. But I, um, I said I had a, a crush on Watson, um, and Madeline sort of made a face. But um, <laughs> <laughs> not right now. But when I first said it, but, but it made me realize that that the word crush is a very um, human emotional word. You know that we use when we talk about humans relating to other humans. And I wonder, Eric, in your work in your team, like if your team starts to develop like um, human emotions towards this, uh, towards the computer, um, or if it's something that you notice just like from fringy people like me that have no idea. <laughs> So I think actually a lot of people have a crush on Watson. And I'll just take this moment to say that the word crush has many different meanings. Uh, you'll be curious to know uh, if you think about language. But uh, I think one, one of the best examples of the team's uh, relationship with Watson is that we actually can get very defensive when uh, people you know, pick on Watson. And so uh, I think that is an example of the emotional attachment that we have. Uh, being creators of the technology, of course, you're, you're very invested in it. Um, we did have a moment just prior to the Jeopardy match when we were in this last minute 
uh, testing and testing for all sorts of scenarios where things might go wrong. What if the Jeopardy system delivered the clue with weird punctuation or complete gibberish? We just wanted to make sure that the system wouldn't crash. And one of the engineers, my senior engineer, was getting a little punchy and created a test set with a whole bunch of questions for Watson to answer, such as, you know, in Jeopardy style, this is my favorite color, this is my favorite animal, this is my favorite programming language. And sure enough, Watson has favorites in all of those. <laughs> Watson's favorite color was purple. The favorite animal, uh, actually top ranked, was pet, just sort of the generic pet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Further, further down in the list was a meerkat and a dromedary, which is, is a, a kind of camel, in case you didn't know, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, yes. I just, I, I will say that when we, I hope this isn't speaking out of turn, when we went up to Yorktown to, when we went to visit uh, IBM, we had an opportunity to speak with a number of members of the, of the team. Um, and I asked, how do you feel about Watson? And right away, one of the, um, the computer scientists said, I love Watson. Um, and then another one said, Watson is my third child. Um, and then backtrack, backtrack, backtrack. But why not? Why not? Why not love Watson when you're working so hard on, uh, on making Watson what it is? And the third child one was not me. I have three real children. So. <laughs> um, my name is Jessie. Um, I was really intrigued by the fact that our main character began her um, entrepreneurial endeavor with this idea that she was going to make better with her tool, but by the time we got to the end of the play, she lost that idea that venture capitalists had stepped in, and the technology had kind of taken off. And I'd be very interested in what all four of you on the panel think about whether we have the cultural and political tools that we need to keep up with the tools that we're inventing and to make sure that we negotiate the relationship between the two people properly, whatever that means. <laughs> That's an important question. Um, <laughs> and I think that we need me at the top of the world saying, saying how all of these things should be used, which is to say it's, it's really hard to figure out you know, who's the right person to answer these questions and whose priorities should be the right priorities. And I think the, the most we can do, at least the most I can do, is make sure that you always ask yourself those questions, that you never, <laughs> that you never just start reacting to everything, especially technology like Watson, which is really cool, by saying, oh, this is really cool, and accepting it right away, that we remember to remain skeptical and to say, you might be cool, but let me first test you a little bit further. And as someone who loves, uh, who loves fiction and who loves reading and for whom that's a really big part of life, I would say go back to the great science fiction writers and see how they've been answering this question for the last, you know, 70 plus years. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure there's such a thing as a good tool. Um, atomic energy is good if you want heat cheaply. It's not so good if you live in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I think, you know, a rock is something that's good as a paper holder, but it also wouldn't be fairly comfortable if it was smashing into your skull. So. It's just a deep question. It's, I don't th I th and I think you can almost ask the same question about people. You know, Jesus or President, well, your favorite president, President Lincoln, <laughs> aside, I don't know that there's, um, there's I'm not, I think it's even an open question about humans themselves, whether there's such a thing as, so this is just, um, this is just the complexity of being alive. Uh, everything has flavors and Moral judgment is the ability to distinguish between something that's going well and something that's not going well, and then to stop the not so and allow the so, the good stuff. But that is a very hard thing to do. Well, we're certainly trying to identify opportunities to apply Watson as a tool in ways that would be helpful. And that's why, for the last couple of years, the research team has focused on the healthcare space as something that uh, I think could be beneficial, but also is just a really interesting, hard problem to solve mm -hmm. and to figure out how to uh, provide support for physicians to ultimately make better decisions. Uh, 
but uh, you know, thinking about these more challenging questions about the role of technology and, and the role of tools, uh, I think is an important uh, part of that. So, I mean, you're the one that, uh, in the end, had the the the, the vision squashed by the uh, venture capitalists. So, <laughs> you'll have to explain that. <laughs> I just I, I didn't I didn't do it to indict venture cap or R and D or anything. I think it's I just think it's worth refreshing your vision periodically and asking exactly as you're saying. I mean the play doesn't I don't think come down on one side or the other. I mean it doesn't go that well for her, but um, mm -hmm. more. Hi, I'm Carol. Um, I'm an attorney and. A really big thing, this question is mostly for you, Eric, but also Madeline, as well in terms of tools. Um, because it's so cheap and we make so many emails and everything, right now there's a really hot issue in um, electronic discovery. Uh, we have a lot of cases now that have like 20 million documents. And there's a new thing that's been approved within the last few years by some courts um, called predictive coding where they come in and predict how an attorney would decide how valuable a document is to the case. And so I've always, you know, have a little problem with it, and I can't decide if it's because, you know, I'm like the old ways better. But um, for instance, we had a case where there was no problem. It, it, the, the company said, our client said, oh, we had no problem. And then there's the smoking gut email was, Houston, it's Apollo calling. <laughs> okay, so our contention was there's never going to be, you know, a prediction that that is the smoking gun email from a, a computer. So do you think in the future, I think mostly of Watson as being a really sophisticated interface to get trivia or to make accessible a huge amount of data that is right or wrong. But do you think in the future, computers will be able to predict what humans think? Uh, <laughs> do I, th you know, I, I, to be able to predict what humans think, I don't think so. Uh, to be able to analyze a document and make some prediction about the content or the value of that document. So that's what this system is currently trying to do. And it's actually something that this world of big data makes possible. So with more and more data and more and more examples, it does become possible to train a computer model that can do that. The challenge, though, again, is to be able to explain why the system believes that this document is going to be relevant or not relevant. And this notion of discovery is, is a, an interesting challenge because typically you do want to find that one piece of information that is the smoking gun. And that's interesting you mention that because just in the past week we've been having a conversation about whether we should really dig into metaphors and couldn't imagine where, certainly in the medical domain, metaphors don't typically come up, but now I see in the legal domain, yes, we'll have to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gun smoking in this cabinet somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Brown, when you first began speaking, you talked about the 50s and um, artificial intelligence uh, was being done. And, and as we see through the years, many things have been done by the uh, presence
older databases that people had, we didn't call them databases then. If you put it into the same format, then the set of programs that you used to analyze would be multifunctional and would yield a whole lot. He happened to be studying linguistics and he thought, wow, in, in the area of dictionaries and, and speech, wouldn't the linguist just love to have this powerful ability to bring together uh, various databases into a standard format. And the, the uses that he showed for this were wonderful, but it didn't answer any need <laughs> that the humans who were linguists had expressed, and they ignored it. In the library field, they were associated with the Institute for Library Research, they created fantastic tools, but it wasn't being done by librarians, they didn't have any librarian input, and the stuff that was produced was ignored. Uh, within a 10 year period, it began to be used, and we had uh, hard catalogs that were put into machine form, and, and people began to be interested in this. But my question is really, you have the technical ability to, to do things, but it's not being, it's not a response to a need that humans uh, come to the machine with a, a cotton gin or inventions. Uh, they, they come up because people wanted them, they needed them, and, they, and, and then somebody figured out a way to solve it. So, so are, you are, you, are you asking why, uh, why some things don't get pursued, or are you, saying, are you oh, asking I'm specifically just, about the need that I'm Watson felt? i just that it struck me at the time. Why are they creating this stuff without first having somebody come to them and say, we need yeah, no, I think that's an interesting. I, 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 no, I think that's an interesting. Oh, sorry, but, uh, before we, before we launch and answer the question, I just want to. I promised Maria um, that I would get her out of here before six o'clock. We still have time for a few more questions, but we will. Um, but but uh, thank you, Maria, so much. We're, I'm going to take your mic from you. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. And now I forgot what I was going to say. You were going to say <laughs> sorry, something sorry. about the oh, questions and so I think, and you know, In computer science, it actually creates this opportunity to explore a whole bunch of ideas. And in fact, we, we often find that we think we've come up with something new, and then you'll talk to a colleague from a different area, and they say, oh, we tried that years ago. And there's this interesting phenomena where there are a lot of ideas that are often ahead of their time. And Artificial intelligence is very well known for that. There was this period in the 80s where there was all these fantastic ideas that didn't pan out. And then there was the AI winter where there was all this disillusionment and disappointment. But ultimately, uh, they were just ahead of their time and the computational power eventually caught up with that and then there were real applications of this technology. And so I think that is an, it, it demonstrates the need to always explore these new ideas and uh, eventually look for applications of that technology. There is a little hidden reference to something called the Babbage machine in the play, which was an enormous <clears throat> machine constructed at public money uh, with the permission and, and support of the prime minister, which was uh, using weaving technology, and mm -hmm. it suffered that fate. It, right. no well, one it wasn't quite... constructed, was it, in his lifetime? It was never fully built, right? It wasn't built it was until it. quite recently. No, I think, I think they, uh, they didn't build the, the full the version, full. but they did, yeah, they spent a lot of money and they built, they built early, like, I guess, 1.0 versions. Right. I, had, I, only lo I looked into it because apparently he had an assistant who foiled him on some level, who was, who was quite disenchanted with, by, with him, and I thought maybe he would be an interesting figure, but then he didn't pan out. Yeah. He was wrongly named for my purposes. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's, I feel like that's. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thank you all so much for. Um, Thanks for